Bobby Bell was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Kansas City Chief of them all. He was an amazing athlete who lined up at linebacker and defensive end, and he played in an era when the Chiefs-Oakland Raiders rivalry was at its peak in intensity. With the Chiefs playing host to the Raiders on Sunday, who better to discuss the rivalry than Bell? On Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast presented by Big O Tires. I'm your host, Blair Kirkhoff. It's Monday, November 25th. Star columnist Vahe Gregorian and I chatted with Bell on Monday, and he's got the goods on the Raiders. We also talked about what Bell believes is the greatest defense of all time. Hint, he was on it. And why he once followed running back Clem Daniels into the Raiders' huddle. We also spent some time talking about Bell growing up in a segregated North Carolina town and some of his experiences as an All-American at Minnesota. After the break, KU beat writer Jesse Newell joins me to preview the Jayhawks in Maui. Kansas opens play against Chaminade on Monday, and Bill Self sees the advantages of playing three games in three days. But first, here's the conversation with Bobby Bell, Vahe Gregorian, and me. We are delighted to have as our guest today on Sportsbeat KC, Bobby Bell, the greatest of Kansas City Chiefs. It's been written, it's been said, and I believe it. And Vahe Gregorian, I think you believe it as well. I do believe it as well. And what's really cool about having Bobby here is, is seeing Bobby, getting to know him after his career, getting to share things with him like this time, but also getting to go with him to his graduation at the University of Minnesota a few years ago, one of the greatest things I ever got to cover. So we're honored to have you, Bobby. Well, thank you. It's glad to be here. You know, as my brother said, he's a martician. It's better to be seen than viewed. <laughs> and that's a good statement. <laughs> well, we just thought the, the week of the Chiefs-Raiders game would be a great time to talk to you um, about the rivalry, about playing the Raiders, and some of the most memorable games in Chiefs history involved battles against the Oakland Raiders. Um, and, and I guess my first question to you, Bobby, would be, was it everything that we were told in terms of intensity and uh, just the, the, the atmosphere and the feeling of the, of, the, of the teams toward each other? Well, yes, I would say that everything they told you, you know, and more to it than that, <laughs> you know, it was a lot of intensity, you know. That was a game that you, that was a must game. Everybody don't realize, you know, we could have, the Raiders could have the worst season, Kansas City can have the worst season, but when we hook up, that was like the Super Bowl game. I mean, it was a dog eat dog that day. You know, everybody said, well, the Raiders are coming. Well, we started getting ready for them because it's, it's, a, it's going to be a dog fight. So everybody knew each other, too. I mean, it seems like when you, when you look at the, the, the rosters, those names are so familiar. Um, the, the Chiefs, you guys stayed together for such a long time. And those great Raiders teams back in the 60s, it seems like those guys were together a long time. So. It was, a, it was a familiar game. Well, you know, that, that's a good point there. People don't realize that we had our defense. I mean, it was very seldom that someone got hurt, you know. Even that year that we went to the Super Bowl, we had no defensive player out miss a game for the whole year. That's why we told everybody, hey, we, have, we thought we had the best defense because we didn't have nobody out. We lost Lenny Dawson for seven games. So all we told him, say, hey, man, hey, y'all kick a couple field goals, and we don't think the team can <laughs> score on it. And that's how we felt about our defense, because we were all together, you know. And, you know, going against the Raiders, hey, it was a, uh, something that you prepared for. You know you're going to be in a fight, you know. It's going to be a dog fight, you know, whether they playing here or there, you know. And uh, I used to tell people all the time, Al Davidson used to have one player, one player they don't care about, uh, start a fight with Otis Taylor <laughs> so he can get kicked out of the game. I mean, stuff like that, you know. I mean, we go out to the stadium out there to play before we can get in there. Uh, Coach Stram would have Bobby Yarbrough go up there and go through the ceiling and get all the mics out and everything. Because he, he figured they're going to be recording us, you know. They're going to know what's going on. So any edge, you know. One year we went out there to play. And they hadn't cut the grass <laughs> in about a month, you know, the long drive. One year we go out there, they had water. It hadn't rained in six months. And once half of the field back there soaking in water, <laughs> they go, oh, no, the sprinkler broke. <laughs> I mean, all On your kinds, side. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, hey, slow us down. Because, you know, when we were playing against her, we had the fast guys, quick guys, small guys, and the big guys. 
you know, and it's, it's all, it's, people don't realize the stuff that we had to go through. Well, you take uh, like uh, Art Shell, Gene Upshaw, they drafted them guys so they can be able to block Buck Buchanan. When they try to block Buck, we got Curtis, I mean, Curly Cup. Now they got, hey, now who are you going to do now? Because they just, uh, just manhandling everybody. Well, that, that's a great point, that the, the, the teams, the Chiefs and the Raiders were, were kind of so much better than everybody else that you, you sort of you, you, you operated against each other. You, you, uh, you built a team to beat the Raiders, and the Raiders built a team yep. to beat the Chiefs. We, we, they draft guys. <laughs> so Specifically for Specific for the Chiefs, and we draft people, too, for, you know, for them guys. You know. But that's, that was the name of the game. And I think that's, that still goes on right now. You know, with the Raiders. And, you know, there's another thing, you know, I, I like to bring out is that we would have a dogfight on the field. But, you know, after the, we was friends. And, you know, and, and I tell people this all the time. I said, you never know. Like, we lost a, a lot of the Raiders, you know, I mean, I know them personally. I go out there, you know. But when you're off the field, we are personally friends, good friends. And we care about each other. And when we own the field, it's a different thing. And we realize that. And we realize that. And uh, I tell you what, it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's tough sometimes. Uh, go ahead, Bob. No, just would you say that I think of people like Ken Stabler and people like that, it, it, you really felt for them. Oh, yeah. In, the, in their we, hard we times later. Yeah. And like Willie Brown just passed away yeah. from them. Ken Stabler. I mean, guys that we played against, that we raised I mean, together, you know, I, you know, some, a lot of the guys, man, uh, Clem McDaniel, you know, I mean, I'm going like, wow, man. We played, you know, people don't realize, I played in the last All-Star with, with a lot of the Raiders, you know, we had a lot. We had probably one of the All-Star game, we had 11 Chiefs players and about 10 Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, on the All-Star, you know. And we was buddy, when we, they put us together, boom. Hey, we was together. <laughs> yeah, we didn't lose no games, you know, but that's how, that's how we became friends and, and family and stuff like that. And you know, people get on me and say, "Hey, man, you go, you going out to the Raiders?" Yeah, every year I go out there and play golf. You know, they have a fundraiser. We have I go out there and play golf with the Raiders. They say, "Aren't you scared?" No, I can go out. To, I go out to the games and walk around. You know, but uh, that's that just I don't know. It's is it's, it going to be? Is it going to be tough to to not have the Raiders in Oakland? You know, after it's going to be year? rough. It's going to be rough. But I think it's a good move for them. I guess you know, financial wise, it's going to be great. You know, you got now. Hey, they're not out there in Oakland. Look at the uh, other teams that are going to play them next year. Who are they going to play them in? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Well, yeah, you know, the people's already got their reservation. People are going to make it a weekend. They're going to make it a big week. I bet you every team that we're going to take maybe 15 to 20 people, I mean 20,000 people out to there. So they can, hey, it's going to be a long weekend. Where are you going? To Vegas? <laughs> you think it's going to, that's going to be, hey, I don't know. I know I got a buddy that bought him a, he bought two townhouses across the street from the, the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are you going to do with them? I'm rent them out, man. Heck yeah, he is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Oh. So, you, uh, do you think it by them going to Las Vegas does it really change? Do you think it does change the feeling of the rivalry overall? I mean, the Las Vegas Raiders is does it is it going to lose something with this? I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, against the Raiders, it's always going to be that way. You know, they used to call it the black hole and stuff. Hey, I think it's still going to be the same. The Raiders and the Chiefs. It's going to be a big row. You know. Silver and black, I guess that's not going to change, is no, it? No, I don't so, think so. You know. So you you know you referred to that All Star game, and I think it was fitting that that the last AFL game ever played was against was Chiefs versus Raiders in the the AFC Championship AFL Championship yeah. game to for the right to go to the Super Bowl. Right. You guys go out to Oakland, and it is a turnover fest, and a lot of fumbles lost, and. It was Dawson against LaMonica, um, a lot of turnovers in that game. But the Chiefs prevailed 17-7 to 7 
to go to the Super Bowl. I'm wondering if you if you had any specific memories about that game. Well, the thing is, though, you know, Oakland beat us twice that year. In the regular season. You were only two losses that year. Yeah, they beat us twice. And, you know, and New York Jets, you know, they figured they was going back two years in a row to the Super Bowl. They said, well, the Chiefs coming here and we're going to play the Chiefs. They come to my house. In my backyard, we're going to knock them off. We go out and knock the Raiders off and go on to the Super Bowl. It didn't work that way. We said, uh, because we felt at that time, going into the se- at the end of the season, Lenny Dawson is back with us, and uh, we felt like, hey, there's no way they can beat or, You know, no way New York's going to beat us. Joe thought they was. Man, we stopped them right there. We goal, st- big goal line oh, stand in oh, yeah. that game, a you famous know, goal line yeah, stand. Yeah, and, you know. Joe, he always getting on me because he thought I was going to take a fake. I said, hey, man, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> he said, you, you got to take that fake. We stopped him. When Lanier was there, you know, going, hey, man, they down there at the goal line. I said, hey, there's no way, guys. We look at each other and go, no way these guys going to score on them. And they didn't. We stopped them. June. Next thing you know, we beat them. Now we go out to play the Raiders. And everybody, you know, coach goes on saying, man, these guys beat us twice. What do you think? We say, well, no, there's no way in the world they're going to beat us three times. Our team is better. It's getting better. Our defense, we haven't lost one defensive player a whole year, and we are at our strong point. Hey, we went out there and just shut them down. Boom. And once they you know, had some turnovers there, but there's no way we're going to walk away with this. And the funny thing about that, you know, is Al Davis told uh, the players, Oh, and we knocked them off twice. Oh, and yeah, they coming out here. We going to the ro- we going to the Super Bowl. Won't you guys? Wait. I tell you what, we're gonna do. We're gonna just gonna leave right from here and go straight into the Super Bowl. Bring your suitcases and stuff. And you know, Coach Scram found out that they had the suitcases and all that stuff. We we got on the bus. I said, let's go. No, no, let's wait. Let's wait. I said, well, what is we waiting on? He already found out. They, them guys got a walk. They thought we was gone. They walked out with their suitcase. <laughs> we go, oh my God. They walked out and go, okay. <laughs> oh, that is great. I never heard that story. Oh, no. I shouldn't have told, I shouldn't have told y'all that. You it's know. about time. 50, oh, 50 year limit. Can we erase that? You should wish that. <laughs> huh? You didn't know that? Well, I didn't remember that story. I didn't, I didn't know I did, the bus. I, did. I didn't know the bus stayed. Yeah, that's oh, right. That's so, right. To, to let you guys watch the Raiders with the. Suitcases. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, Bobby, the, the year before <laughs> ended with a big loss to the Raiders, whatever it was, 41-6. to six or, or Previous a, year. The previous year ended that way. And I wonder if you could explain what impact that loss had on the offseason and, and your preparation for the next year. Did it well, matter? Well, the thing is, though, we, we felt we had a good team going in, you know, and we lost. We shouldn't have lost that game. And, you know, well, at that time, you know, we had a lot of guys that personally, you know, involved. Hey, this is, we are better than a team than this. So how are we going to approach this? We approach it in a whole totally different way that we're just going to, hey, this year we're going to come out and prevail in this year. And that's what we did. We came out, we trained. We had, uh, uh, Alvin, what's the guy's name? Alvin Roy was a uh, weight coach. He, nobody wanted him. He left Dallas because they said we were going to get rid of him. And Coach Stram picked him up, and he came here. And we had the guys lifting weights and stuff like that, good shape. And, oh, man, it was just unbelievable. Quickness, speed. Coach, he loves that, the speed. We had, you know, we had guys, Mike Garrett, all these guys just fast, speedy Gonzalez, man. We had big guys, but strong, curly, you know, quick, the rouse. And there's no way. We had... We had a lot of players that people don't realize. We had coaches on the field playing. I mean, we had, uh, you know, Emmett Thomas back there, Johnny Roberts. We, we all play. I played quarterback at one time. We had coaches, you know, and we sat back there. If you notice in, in all our game back then that the players, 11 players on the field, we didn't run off the field, platoon or nothing like that. We played the defense that we were supposed to play, and we'll check off just as much as the offense. They check off, we look at it, oh oh, uh oh, we gotta get out of this. And we'll check off. And we played with the players there. We are capable of that. We had enough players out there, eleven guys out there, could change and adjust to all kinds of situations. And that's the way it was, you know. 
Bobby Bell is our guest, and I need to make I need to make a correction here. It wasn't the previous year; it was two years before two that years. because Oakland beat the Chiefs and went to Super Bowl II. Of course, the Jets played in Super Bowl III, yeah. and and then the, the Chiefs and Vikings in, in Super Bowl IV. So, um, so we've touched on it a couple different ways: the goal line stand against the Jets, the um, the, the great defensive game that you played in the AFL Championship game in 1969. You know, with with Johnny Robinson going into the Hall of Fame this year, that means six starters on that Super Bowl four defense are now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton. Of course, you're you're one of them. You're the first chief to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, two things, Bobby. Um, I, I sense that there's still a, a closeness about the team. Maybe maybe not just the defense, but the entire team, because I, I see you guys together often. Vahe and I had an opportunity to, to spend some time with uh, with Willie Lanier and Jan Stenerud in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, and and so the closeness of the team, but also, do, do, you, do you have, has time allowed you to appreciate just how great that defense was? Well, I, tell, I still tell people that, you know, I think we had the greatest defense in anyway. They had the purple people, you know, hey man, they didn't have a chance, you know. Uh, we we had uh, you know like you said we have six guys it should be some more on the defense to go in there you know Jimmy Marcella should go you know and these guys was a bump and run guy him and Emmons and all and and the thing about it you know it, Jim Lynch I mean I I will play I will go to war with Jim and uh, Willie Lanier anytime as linebacker top linebackers and we had. Uh, Oh man! Well, Aaron Brown, he, he didn't play that long, you know. He passed, you know, and we, we lost a couple of jury mates. I mean, we had guys out there was like coaches. I mean, we'll come up there and we just say, "Hey guys, hold it over." We said, "We got to get out of this, right? You know, we can't cover this thing. We change the play defense." You know, I know Coach Bettis uh, upstairs going, "What are they doing out there? We had to get out of there." And I always told Coach, "I coach, if you screw up." Jump on us, you know, because I used to change cover with uh, J Jimmy uh, uh, Kearney, Jim Kearney. Kearney, right? He's he get up behind the tight end, and go, hey Bell, say, God there ain't Bell, uh, I can't keep up with this guy. Can you take him? I said, Yeah, I'll take him. You make sure you got my back, and we'll switch off. And the coach go up there. What are you guys doing? That's not the coverage. I said, well, coach, don't get on us until we mess up. Then you chew us out. And we just switch. And, that the, and what happened is that, the, you know, the tight end be going on the field waiting on Jim Kearney. I'm, I'm running with him, going talking to him. Hey, man, where are you going? You going home or somewhere? You know, what's going on, you know? Oh, that's, the, that's, that's the stuff we did all the time, you know? Clint McDaniel one time, uh, the plan. And the coach, he was catching more passes, and that's when they started sending the line on their back out and pat him, you know? Now, they, instead of having two fullbacks, I mean, two running backs, they got, it's just like putting a receiver right. back there out there. So they used their back and made him like a receiver. And Al Davis said, man, let's, let's use him. He goes out there, and the week before we played him the first time, Coach Scram comes up to me and says, Bell said, you got uh, Clem. You cover him. Everywhere. You got him. I said, if he goes to the other side, you say, you go with him. That's your man. You follow him wherever he goes. You got to cover him. He's catching too many balls. And I go, okay. So I said, all right. He comes out there, clams out there. The first time they did it, he run, did a cut up the sideline. He was flying and running next to him. I said, hey, Clem, where you headed? You know, I talked to him, you know. He goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I got you today, man. <laughs> Funny thing, though, is that People don't know this, is that it was going all over. He go to the other side, I got him all. He ain't catching nothing. And so the coach called timeout. He called timeout. It was on their sideline, next close to their sideline. And Clem ran over and stood in the hole, you know. And I went over there, just like this, stood right next to him. And the coach looked up, God damn, man, what are you doing over here? I said, uh, the coach told me I had to cover him. I got to follow him wherever he go. He said, get your pump out of here. And you can see, you know, that I'm running across the field <laughs> from the hollow, you know. And, you know, before Clem passed away, God rest his soul, I did a, a lot of stuff for Oakland, you know. They, they came in here, and they came to my house, and we did about two hours 
thing on the Raiders and stuff. And Clem, before he passed away, he, he said, you make sure you ask Drell about the time he had to cover me. And the guy asked me about it, you know. I said, oh, yeah, and I told him this story, that I was standing right next to him in the hull over there, in the Raiders' hull. And, and the coach, what, you, hey, what are you doing over here? I said, and the coach told me I had to follow him everywhere. You know, well, this this helps explain your 28 career interceptions that, uh, <laughs> for for a lineman slash linebacker, uh, which is an unheard of uh, amount. In addition to everything else that you did in, in your career, all the All Star games and the uh, All Pro and all AFL, all NFL honors. What what really fascinates me, Bobby, about your career though, and we talked about it before we went on the air, how uh, you're from Shelby, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, but couldn't play in the state. Uh, so Southern schools weren't integrated at the yeah. time. But North Carolina coach Jim Tatum um, recommended you to Murray Warmoth, the Minnesota coach. Yeah. He, and that's how you got from North Carolina to Minnesota and, and started a great, great college career. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> I owe a lot to Coach Tatum. And man, I, every time I think about it, you know, that's just, a time that I got the opportunity to leave North Carolina, you know, people don't realize it. <clears throat> my dad, <clears throat> my dad told me, he told, "Hey, if you got the opportunity to leave, leave." He said, "Get out of here," you know, if you wanted to expand things for you in this country, you got to get out of here <clears throat> because a lot of people didn't realize, it. like you said, it was segregated. Everything was segregated, you know. And I wanted to play in North Carolina because I, I saw prep books and stuff like that where the, uh, the people we worked, uh, my dad worked for a textile mill and stuff, and they sent their kids off to prep school, North Carolina and Duke, you know, and they'll come back. And I'm out there at the uh, country club, you know, cutting the grass and stuff like that. And they used to call me and say, hey, Bobby, come here. I said, yeah. I said, look, and I read these, I look at these books, and I go, wow. And I run back and tell my dad, I say, man, you think I could go to this school like this? I would love it. And I had this vision of leaving and doing stuff like that. And my dad just kept saying, yeah, you can do that. So I had the opportunity to go to Minnesota. Never been on a plane before. Never been on a plane. Get out of the States, you know. They, they finally said, and Taylor said, coach, you got one scholarship. You ought to give it to this kid. A little black kid up next to the mountain. He's a hell of a player. He said, I saw him in the All-Star. He got most of, he's a VIP for the All-Star here. He said he could play. But he played six man, you know, you have to teach right. him, you know. And you played offense too, right? Oh, I was offense, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they finally went, Oh, okay. But they sent me a uh, plane ticket, I went up there and I told my dad, Hey man, I ain't never seen that many people in my life, you know. You have to realize in Minnesota at that time, 2% is black in the whole state, you know. You walk around, you don't see a right. lot of black pe people, you know. And I'm going like, oh, man, it was, it, was diff it was very difficult for me to make that adjustment, but I wasn't leaving. So I, was, I played quarterback my uh, first year, freshman, because at that time, freshmen couldn't play varsity, you know. So I ran the other team plays against the I team, and... <laughs> I just, they couldn't stop me, you know. I was all over. And the coach wanted to say, hey, Bell, run the play right. I said, coach, here it is. <laughs> That's what they did, you know. He said, well, all right, man, let's get on over. So that, that went on the whole freshman year. And then I, I wanted to play baseball. And he said I could because at that time, Minnesota was a national champion right. in baseball. And I said, I was a better baseball player than I was a football player. And I turned it down. Uh, to go play baseball with the White Sox, you know. They had a farm. guy was there looking. He was going to put me in a farm league somewhere, bring me on up. And I, that's what I wanted to do. And the dad said, no, no, no. You said you want to go to school. Do that. And so I did. I went to school. I promised him what I would do, and I went to school. So I played quarterback. He switched me to offensive tackle at University of Minnesota. I said, man, I never played offensive tackle. Quarterback to the tackle. I went from ball handling to man handling now. Kind of hand. <laughs> so that's what happened, you know, and that's where it started. You know, it started back there, and I, I thank God all the time that I had the opportunity to, to take the advantage of it. 
And from that point on, I have really, life has been good to me, you know. And uh, I made the adjustments, because a lot of people said, no, nope, Bobby, you shouldn't go up there. They don't know you. You, you become a number, you know, which was right. But that number, if you do the right things, make the right decision, it would, it would pay off for you. And I have not looked over my shoulder yet, you know. How many people can say that they've met five presidents, travel around the world, you know? We couldn't be more delighted to have you in studio, Bobby, and uh, Bobby Bell, I think the greatest chief of all time, and Vahe Gregorian. It's been great to have you here as well. Thank you, Blair. We're going to take a break, and when we return, I'm going to talk to Jesse Newell, our Kansas beat writer, who's at the Maui Invitational with the Jayhawks. Big O' Tires is rolling out Black Friday deals now through December 8th. Get limited-time Black Friday savings on oil changes, brakes, car batteries, and more. Plus, save up to $190 on select Michelin and P.F. Goodrich tires when you use your Big O' Tires card with no interest financing for 12 full months OAC. Don't miss Black Friday deals happening now through December 8th only at Big O' Tires. For your nearest participating location, go to BigOtires.com. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners. Unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Jesse, how many how many times have you covered the Maui Invitational? This will be my third time, Blair, and yeah, this is definitely one of the perks of the job when the company sends you over to what is paradise. I almost laughed when I looked at the long-term forecast when we're going to be there because every single day, no rain, high of 85, low of 72, every day was within one degree of that. So uh, yeah, it really is paradise when you go out there. But I covered when KU lost in the championship game to Duke back, I guess it'd be eight years ago now. In 12, uh, when they yeah, went back. When they went on to play in the national championship game. 2011-2012, and then four years ago when they defeated Vanderbilt in the title game to take the Maui Invitational. So, yeah, third time for me, but uh, Maui is an amazing place, and I can definitely see why KU goes here every fourth year. And, you know, playing three games in three days, which you're guaranteed to do, I think is going to serve this particular team well just because it just seems like through the first few games, Bill Self is still trying to figure out the, you know, the the – three around two or the four around one and, you know, opponents, three opponents in three games with, you know, differing levels of, you know, competition will allow him to just, I guess, take more notes about the way he wants to play or can play and what, what he, you know, I, I guess find an identity for this team. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of fascinating. I think maybe they've gotten a little bit of growth with that. And it's um, interesting because it's almost like Jalen Wilson's injury has sort of, helped in a weird sense. And I'm not saying that they couldn't use Jalen Wilson. He's a very talented player, you know, might a top 50 recruit potentially could have been a one or two and done with Kansas before he suffered his broken ankle. But what it's done is now it's limited the rotation to nine guys. And so for Kansas, um, Bill Self, you know, even at the end of the season, he only likes to go eight or nine man rotation. So basically every player that they're playing now is going to get in in some form or fashion, um, whether that's with the two big lineup or with the four guard lineup. It kind of forces him to play those guys and you sort of keep them mostly happy and then also kind of maybe assign them roles where, hey, if you get nine minutes and do this well, then great. That's that's your role. And like we saw from Sylvie DeSosa, he didn't get many minutes the last game against East Tennessee State, but he played the final six minutes and made some of the biggest plays of the game. 
game. And so you can kind of divvy it up that way to say, hey, uh, you might not play a ton of minutes, but you have a very important role on this team. And no matter what happens over a five game stretch, you're going to get some time because KU you can't play only six players. You know, they got to play seven, eight, nine uh, for a stretch just because otherwise you're going to tire all your guys out. So, yeah, Bill Self primarily did four guards against East Tennessee State. The two big look, I think, is getting better over time. But KU's played a lot of smaller lineups, so it's very difficult to play that way. And I think what Bill Self is coming to in in his mind, at least right now, is he's going to start the two big look. He's going to see how it, it kind of handles things the first couple minutes. And then if he needs to switch to four guards, he will. And that's sort of how he's he's dealt with it so far. And uh, for Kansas, it's worked out fine. I mean, yeah, I think for them, it, it kind of makes them a little bit versatile, kind of like a chameleon. You know, if a team plays this way, you can play with them this way. If a team can't handle your your big men inside, you can play a different way. And so for Bill Self, I think he's starting to embrace that versatility uh, instead of maybe deciding that he has to have an identity. And for this Kansas team, they've been pretty successful so far, uh, kind kind of splitting up those two sides and making sure that uh, all these guys get in, whether it's with four guards or with two bigs. Maui always has the best field of any you know college basketball regular season tournament. This year, no exception. Kansas is the marquee team on its side of the bracket, along with uh, you know BYU and UCLA are in the other semifinal or the other first round game. Kansas would play one of those two teams in its second game. Michigan State, of course, is the is is in the bracket as well on the on the top half of the bracket. So, if it's you know there, there's no seeding in this thing, but if there was, Kansas and Michigan State would be the top two seeds and expected to play in the championship games. But to get there, let's just Kansas got to you know they'll they'll play Chaminade and and assuming a victory there. Uh, look, I'm old enough to remember when Chaminade beat Ralph Sampson in Virginia. In fact, I was working for a newspaper in Virginia when that happened and. Um, you know, probably the biggest upset in college basketball history. I don't expect that to happen uh, this time. But uh, so I'm looking at UCLA and BYU for for Kansas. UCLA is, unde- is undefeated. BYU's lost a couple games, but I really can't tell. Neither one is getting ranked or, or votes even in the polls. So I don't know. I just don't know the strengths of either of those teams. A Kansas UCLA matchup is always fun because it's a couple of blue bloods. I can't remember the last time KU played BYU, but anyway, uh, second round is when the thing should really start for Kansas. Yeah, and you, I mean, again, we we are the media analysts here, so we can you know overlook opponents if you want to. And yeah, Shamanad, uh, that will not be a close game. That's just. Uh... Uh, D2 team going up against Kansas. KU played them four years ago and won by 50. Um, they play them a lot in this tournament, it seems like, and uh, that's going to be about the line for this. You know, KU should win by 40 or 50 points no matter how they play or who they play, all those sorts of things. So uh, it's sort of fascinating this tournament. If you go up and down the bracket, a lot of first year coaches here um, and, and guys, you know, with these programs that historically have been pretty good, you know, the BYUs, the UCLA. Lays of the world. So, you know, you could talk about BYU probably expected to, to win that first game, maybe just a slight favorite in that game against UCLA. But uh, uh, Mark Pope, a new coach there who last four years was at Utah Valley. And then you talk about uh, UCLA, same sort of both that they're in, a, a traditional blue blood. But now Mick Cronin taking over. And as you mentioned, started the season uh, 4-0. and But uh, BYU has a really good win on its ledger so far. They went to Houston and won. And KU fans should know about Houston because Quentin Grimes, the great guard for Kansas, or um, the, the I guess the top five or top recruit, five-star guard for, for Kansas, went to Houston. Now he's playing right away there. So that's a really good win to get an away victory at Houston. Um, but yeah, it, it's sort of a fascinating field where you have a bunch of these coaches that are kind of in their first year with these traditional decent programs. And so that could be a challenge uh, for Kansas in that second game. And it's sort of funny how it turns out because all these teams keep signing up every fourth year to go to Maui. You can only go once every four years. So KU is actually actually played UCLA in the semifinals each of the last two times that they they went there. So uh, that might happen again in this particular game. Uh, It will not be the uh, familiar coach uh, for Kansas going against them in Steve Alford, but uh, it could be the uh, Bruins once again. And uh, like you said, everybody's looking forward to that championship game. If KU can match up against Michigan State in what would be a great matchup and also a top five battle. Yeah, and look, just as an aside too, that Houston team coached by Kelvin Sampson was in the Sweet 16 last year. Played at Sprint Center. Um, that that is a that is a quality program. So a very quality win for BYU earlier this season. All right, Jesse. Thanks a lot, buddy. Yep. Links to the stories we discussed can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. 
Thanks to our guests, Bobby Bell and Jesse Newell, and to producers Leah Becerra and Derek Donovan for putting together today's show. We'll be back on Tuesday with another episode of Sports Beat KC, where we talk sports in Kansas City on a daily basis. 